this video we are going to talk about the second phase of the pre-OPEC era and here we are going to start from 1928. If we remember the timeline, we have already discussed about the oil rush for the first decade after 1859. Then we talked about the Standard Oil Company and its monopoly and then we talk, uh, talked about what happened when the Standard Oil Company actually broke down into five smaller companies and you see the lack of monopoly power in the market. Uh, we ended our previous discussion uh, in the year 1928 where the agreement, some kind of an agreement which is called the Aziz Agreement was reached among the leading oil supplying companies in the world. And today we are going to discuss about a phase, this is this is a little longer, you know, it's, it's almost, you can see here, this is almost a period of three decades and this is called uh, the decade which was dominated by the seven sisters. So these are the seven suppliers, seven big suppliers of oil in the world market. So let us start from 1928 itself. Other than, you know, this Yazis agreement, what are the other things that were going on in the world oil market at that point of time? What are the characteristic features that were emerging and that were, that were kind of deciding the course of world oil market? The first one was you can see a lot of interest of the state in the business of oil. It was manifested in different forms and we have picked up a couple of examples from that. For example, in 1932, there was the cancellation of Anglo-Iranian concession. Now, what was this Anglo-Iranian concession? Let me first, you know, give you a brief about the concession itself. So, basically what happened at that period of time, uh, the underground resources were not owned by the states. So, what did the states do? The states actually permitted the foreign companies to come to their land and therefore, you know, undertake different operations, uh, take the oil out and if they take the oil out, then the oil becomes their property and they can sell the oil, they can run the business and so on. And as a fee against this operation, they would pay a royalty to the state. So that was the usual kind of uh, concession related agreement that were in place. Now regarding this Anglo-Iranian concession, uh, in 1901, the Shah of Persia, which is now actually Iran, uh, it gave the exclusive right to William Knox DRC to, pro you know, the prospect of oil in uh, Persia. No, so Persia is now Iran, right? Now, this, what was happening under this concession as well, uh, Persia was actually receiving a royalty. So, uh, the, comp the UK company was uh, sort of earning the profit and the Persia was actually earning the royalty. Now, what happened in 1930, after the Great Depression, everything changed a bit. I mean, there was a lack of production, the profit margin declined, and therefore, uh, there was a decline in the royalty that was also paid to Persia. And triggered by this fact, actually, there was a cancellation of the Anglo-Iranian concession in 1932. However, a you know, redefined concession came into the force in the next year itself, but there the clauses changed uh, a lot. Uh, although there are, uh, there are, you know, this idea is little debated whether uh, it's only the Great Depression that triggered the cancellation or not. But of course, that was one of the uh, important factors that did it. So you see, here the state intervened, right? The state showed in interest and the state intervened in order to cancel the private concession. The second one is very, very important. As we were discussing that Mexico was really a big player in the international oil market in terms of export and they were exporting a lot of oil at that point of time. Uh, what happened in Mexico is that the new constitution which was adopted after their revolution that was in the beginning early 20th century, this actually gives the ownership of underground resources not to any private entity on the landowner, but to the state. So the land may be owned by a private entity. However, whatever resources is there underground, that is owned by the state. So it could no longer be the case that a private company would come to, you know, Mexico, uh, have the ownership on the land and take all the resources out to the business and pay Mexico a royalty. That was not possible. So this is the you know, first step of state intervention.
1938, the oil industry that was there, the private oil industry in Mexico, that was nationalized. And that was called the Petroleos Mexicanos. So this is, in short, this is called the Pemex. That was established in 1938. So these two incidents, along with many other, actually gestures to the fact that state was getting engaged in the uh, buying and selling of or production and buying and selling of oil in, you know, slowly in the international arena. The other very important thing that happened, the demand for bigger share of profit by the exporting countries. This is one of the very interesting things about oil. Uh, the digging out of oil and you know the discovery, the exploration, the you know refining, the distribution, everything is very very cost expensive. Now the moment the state takes the ownership of resources, there is actually a bifurcation of ownership in the production process. Now what is the bifurcation? You see the resources are owned by the host state who has the oil. However, resource meaning the natural resource, the crude oil, right? However, the resources in terms of technological know-how, in terms of owning the distribution lines, in terms of having financial asset, these things are owned by the foreign companies. So, although the state exerted some power in, in terms of, you know, owning the resources, it had to allow the foreign, uh, foreign partners or foreign companies to come and operate in their own land in order to, you know, run the oil business. However, now that the state claimed the, you know, ownership on the resources, on the natural resources, they also claimed a higher share of profit from these operating companies. So now the state started saying that, the, you know, the small amount of royalty would not work anymore. What you have to give me is a share of profit. And one of the, you know, the rupture point in this context was in 1943, where Venezuela actually obtained a deal of 50-50 profit share. And afterwards, that became the norm. So whenever a private company operates in a sovereign state, the profit that the private company earns will be distributed in a 50 -50, on a 50-50 basis between the state and the private company. So this actually shows that there is, there is a slight change in the nature of the oil market or the production of oil in the international level. There was, a, you know, slowly the state had started intervening. So this is one very crucial observation during 1930s and 1940s. At this, you know, backdrop, what happens? One way you see the demand is increasing. On the other hand, you see that the state has becoming, uh, you know, one of the important players in the market. And thirdly, what is happening is in 1928, where the ASIS agreement was signed, we talked about three leading companies. Now, other than those three leading companies, there were some other companies as well who participated in this agreement. So they also agreed to keep their market share constant. If you look at the list, they are actually the Standard Oil Company of New Jersey. Uh, later, they become Exxon and then there was a merger with Mobil and then they, now they are operating at Exxon Mobil, which is a known name to all of us. The second one was Standard Oil Company New York. Later, they became the Mobil and then they you know joined with Exxon and now you know them as Exxon Mobil. Standard Oil Company of California, now the Chevron. Uh, the Texas Oil Company, the Royal Dutch Shell, you remember this was the merger of the Royal Dutch Oil Company and Shell. And then the Anglo-Persian Oil Company, which is now the BP. And then you have the Gulf Oil, which was operating in uh, Mexican um, Gulf of Mexico. And now this is a part of Chevron and BP. Now, one interesting thing that you can observe now, uh, okay, before I go into that, the standard oil companies of New Jersey, New York and California, uh, it, you can clearly see, I mean, these are three of those five companies that emerged out of Standard Oil Company in 1911, right? So these are the three uh, main, uh, main offshoots of Standard Oil Company. And you see, this is what is very interesting. I mean, started their business in 1870. Now also the big business in, uh, you know, or, or, or the big market share or the big players in the oil market, they are the offshoots of those standard oil companies. This look at this Exxon Mobil or Chevron or, or uh, I mean, BP is also a big, uh, you know, big player in the oil market. 
Now, this, these seven companies, they were the part of the agreement, the Aziz Agreement in 1928. Now, once they agreed to stick to the cartel, once they agreed to stick to this kind of an agreement where they say, okay, we are not going to deviate from our market share and we are going to increase the supply only when there is an increase in demand, then if you take all of them together, then they enjoy sort of a monopoly power. But this kind of market structure is better understood in the format of oligopoly. We'll have a small discussion on oligopoly later. But if you look at this era post 1928 era, before the OPEC was, you know, OPEC was created. So 1928 till 1960, these three decades, this was dominated by these seven companies. And this is, this is the period when we call the rise of seven sisters. What did they do? They had a huge control and market power over the entire supply chain of the world market. So if you see, they are the dominant player and when they act together, so you know, when they are divided, they may not have high market shares, but when they are taken together, they have very high market share and control over the entire supply. However, there was a surge of supply from the Middle East with high rate of discovery. So this is the time period where the seven companies started dominating, but Middle East was gradually coming into the picture. What was very interesting is that you see when we discussed about the Gulf oil pricing and so on, we saw that the world oil market at that point of time was actually dominated by US and Mexico. Now situation started changing, you know, post during 1930, 1940s and so on. What happened, the demand for oil in US grew up to a large extent. However, the US was a little scared whether the domestic supply would be enough to support their increase in demand or not. And therefore, they started, you know, clearly relying on imported oil. So the moment you rely on, you know, imported oil and the moment you become the net importer, from a net exporter, the objectives with regard to price formation changes. So if I am a net exporter, then my objective, so I will be happy if the world price is high, I'm going to gain more out of it. However, if I am a net importer, so I'm actually buying oil from the world market, if we take the net value, then I would like the price not to be so high. So the moment US became a net importer from a net exporter, they were actually looking for cheap oil in the world market, right? And they saw the opportunity is lying in the Middle East because in Middle East, the cost of production of oil was much lower. So it was cheaper. So now US was about to explore the options through which it can actually get oil from Middle East at a lower price. Okay, so you see the objective of a player in the international market changes when it becomes a net importer from a net exporter. Now, let me also again take you back to the concept of this Gulf pricing. You remember that if actually Middle East wants to supply oil under this Gulf pricing scheme to US, then they are going to lose a lot of money in terms of freight. Because the distance between Gulf of Mexico and US is very, you know, I mean, any point of US will be much, much smaller as compared to the distance uh, of a Middle East country, between the Middle East country and some part of US. So they are actually going to a loss of, lot of money in terms of threat if the Middle East countries want to supply oil to US. Now, this was not a suitable situation at that point of time once US became the net importer of oil. So there was, you know, it was quite obvious that there is going to be a departure from the Gulf pricing scheme. Now, what was the departure? The departure came on this way. So initially, Gulf of Mexico was considered to be the sole base. So wherever, you know, irrespective of the source, wherever the uh, oil was supplied, the distance was calculated from Gulf of Mexico. This is the exercise that we did in the last class. However, now what they have done is that they recognized Arabian Gulf as the other base. So now what happens, if you look at this diagram, unlike the other diagram, 
what is happening that P1, so the price quoted at Gulf of Mexico is will be considered as the base price. That is that that stays there. So if Gulf of Mexico will actually charge a price which starts from P1 and follows this particular rank. So instead of writing you know P1 plus alpha uh, alpha P1 plus alpha D, I have written it as P2. Right. So if you supply it from Gulf of Mexico, then this is the line that you follow. So you remember the previous discussion, this is the base price plus the cost of transportation. Now what happens under this changed mechanism, we are saying that when you are, you know, uh, supplying from a country which is not close to Gulf of Mexico, but which is close to Arabian Gulf, then you take the Arabian Gulf as base in order to calculate the distance from the source of supply and the source of demand. So if you are supplying from Arabian Gulf, you start from the best price of Gulf of Mexico, that is fine. But then you charge the amount which is actually uh, the transport cost from the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, So you don't have to stick to, uh, I'm sorry, from the Gulf of uh, African Gulf, not the Gulf of Mexico. So you don't have to stick to Gulf of Mexico as your base. Now imagine what happens if Iran wants to supply uh, oil to for example Iran wants to supply oil for example to uh, Brazil right now you don't have to calculate the transportation cost from Gulf of Mexico to Brazil but you are going to calculate your transportation cost from Arabian Gulf to Brazil so that sort of covers your transportation cost and you don't have to lose in terms of freight so here if you see that this is the line that will be followed by the countries which are closer to Gulf of Mexico and this is the line that is going to be followed by, uh, I'm sorry, so this is again uh, the mistake. So if you look at the line that those, the countries who are close to the Arabian Gulf, they are going to follow this line while the countries which are close to Gulf of Mexico, they are going to follow this line. Okay, now this actually at the point of inter intersection, if you look at this point, this is giving a neutral point. So this is the point, this is the geographical location where the cost of supplying from Gulf of Mexico is equal to the cost of supplying oil from Arabian Gulf. So that is why this is called a neutral point. So it gives you an understanding that if you are towards the left of the neutral point, and if you are, that means you are closer to Gulf of Mexico and you are farther away from Arabian Gulf, then it's better uh, to supply oil from, you know, Gulf of Mexico, right? However, if you are to the right of the neutral point and if you are close to Arabian Gulf, then it's better for those countries who are close to Arabian Gulf to supply the oil. This is how, you know, the market was kind of distributed based on the geographical location. So the countries who are closer to Gulf of Mexico were being supplied by, you know, countries closer to Gulf of Mexico. Countries who are closer to Arabian Gulf, they were actually, you know, uh, being supported or being supplied by the countries in Middle East and so on. Now this method was followed until 1948 till, become, till US became the net importer. So this was a change, but this you know kind this this is not the entire change that took place what was the second phase the second phase was here you see although the base was changed for the calculation of transportation cost the base was not changed for the initial quoted price so everybody was taking the quoted price of gulf of mexico as the base price however the problem is that the you know cost of production in Arab, uh, in the in the Middle East was actually much less as compared to the cost of production in the other parts of the world. Therefore, if everybody takes the quoted price at Gulf of Mexico as the base price, then the you know the Middle East countries they are going to lose a competitive advantage. Why? Because instead of charging the P1, which is the base price at Gulf of Mexico, as their base price, they can charge a lower price because they can produce the oil at a lower price. And therefore, you see what happens that instead of charging P1, if Arabian Gulf can charge P2, which is less than P1, as their base price, then the whole price schedule actually comes down. 
So even if you see your neutral point shifts towards left and the price of oil supplied from Middle East altogether comes down. Now if this kind of a mechanism is introduced, the net importers of oil will actually be benefited. So this was the scheme which was, which was really welcome by the US. However, overall what happened, it led to the expansion of international oil market with decrease in oil price because now you see a glut of supply from the Middle East countries. A concerned US imposed an import quota in the year 1959. So what happened at that point of time? You are getting a lot of you know, cheap imported oil and that was supporting all the activities in US and therefore you realize the tension. We discussed a little bit about the geopolitics at the you know, very initial classes. We'll also talk about energy security. So if all your domestic activities are based on the foreign supply of oil, then there is a reason to be worried. So what you know, US did, it imposed a quota in 1958. You know, recently the quota was removed, but it, the quota stayed there for a long period of time. So you see that with the change in the market structure, with the rise in Seven Sisters, a fall, formation of the cartel, which was again sort of dominated by, uh, it, it has a, dominant, a dominance from US, uh, the cartel was formed, they sort of tried to check the price and however there was some uh, initiation from the part of the government they wanted to you know take part in the whole uh, international scenario of the oil market uh, and also uh, some of the countries they became net importer of oil and the pricing mechanism changed a lot from the gulf pricing to the double base double posting pricing where the middle east were able to supply uh, a lot of oil at a very low cost to the world so this is this is this this went on till 1960 you know uh, so this is this uh, till the opec was formed however just before the opec was formed so uh, this double base with double posting pricing mechanism this did not last till 1960 there was one more pricing mechanism that came into the force uh, that is called the posted price. Now, this posted price was not very, very new. I mean, the posted price was there before as well. Uh, if you look at the, you know, early years of standard uh, standard oil, there also the posted price. So, standard oil uh, was the company who was looking at refining and transportation of oil, right? So, they were actually quoting a price at which they are willing to buy crude oil. So, that was their uh, quoting, that was their posted price. Now, obviously, uh, there was a departure from the posted price and the actual price at which it was sold. Now, in this context, what happened, posted price was, you know, prior to this, uh, in 1956, what we see, that there was a return of the system of this posted price or the buyer set price. So, how the mechanism went on? So, the buyers actually stated what is the price that they are willing to pay both for crude oil and for final product. So the prices of crude oil and the oil products both were posted. Now this price was not actually the price at which the market transaction took place, but this price was taken as a base in order to calculate the tax and royalty. However, the actual price in the market was actually lower than this quoted price or this posted price. Why? Because the suppliers actually wanted to give some concession to the uh, to their customers, to their buyers. Why were they giving the concession? Because they wanted to ensure that, that they have a they have they can supply to their you know buyers for a longer period of time. So they gain this confidence that okay, I'll supply I'll you know you allow me to supply oil for a longer period of time and I give you a price concession. And therefore, the market transaction price was actually lower than the quoted price. As a result, what happened? Uh, the price started becoming non-favorable to the producing countries. So the producing countries always, you know, tried to think what kind of concession should I give to the to our buyers so that my market share is more, I can sell for a longer period of time, I reduce my risk and so on. So the power was sort of transferred in favor of the buyers and the supplying countries were not being able to control the price. 
and they were not pretty much happy about that. Now, this is the period, see, we are talking about 1956. This is the period where the Middle East actually came up with a huge market share of oil supply in the international oil market. So the dominance of US and Mexico had been declined and we see the rise of the Middle East. And these Middle East countries at this point of time realized that through this posted price, they were not you know, being benefited. So they decided that they need to do something. They have to come to some sort of an agreement so that they can check you know, this reduction in price and they can give, they can set up some stable price which is favorable to them for a longer period of time. And this is the genesis of the cartel formation among the countries which are uh, countries who were exporting oil and it is called the Organization of Oil Exporting Countries which was formed in 1960. So in the next lecture, we are going to discuss about that. But this is how the scenario emerged before the, you know, the, the formation of OPEC in the global oil market. Thank you.